Uh, welcome back to the second of our series of panel sessions. Firstly, welcome to Chief of the Air Staff. Sir, thanks. I know you're speaking with us later, but thanks for making the time to be here for the whole afternoon. Hugely appreciated, because I know you're busy, busy. Uh, the feedback thus far has been positive. Um, please keep the feedback coming. A lot of people doorstep me over lunch, but I did get some lunch, so that was the main thing. Uh, so this debate... Uh, is on the topic of national perspectives on being allied by design. Where are the challenges and opportunities for collaboration? And it's not lost on me throughout, uh, how long have we been going now? About five hours worth. It's not lost on me how many times the word collaboration has been used today. I started keeping a little tally and I run out of patience. Um, it does roll off the tongue pretty easily, but the reality of achieving meaningful collaboration, which actually delivers some tangible outputs, as I talked about right at the start, the so what of all of this, actually getting after it, is complex and a pretty multifaceted challenge. So to help expose this and hopefully generate some good debate around the topic, I'd like to begin by introducing very briefly four great panelists, all of whom I know well, uh, and all of whom find themselves right in the mix um, of accelerating their nation's defense space efforts, and in particular, are tackling daily the mechanisms for meaningful international collaboration. Firstly, from Australia, Brigadier uh, Christopher Gardner, who is the inaugural Director General Space Operations Coordination in Australia's new Defence Space Command, which many of you will know just stood up here within the last couple of months. Uh, Christopher is uh, meeting us halfway around his round the world trip. Uh, he's just flown in from Colorado, going the wrong way. The wrong way. So here we are post lunch. Well, I'll maybe make you Collapsing go first. Right yeah, yeah, I'll maybe make you go first. Brilliant. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us. And then to Canada, a strong and handsome dynamic duo in the middle here. Uh, Brigadier General Mike Adamson, uh, Director General Space and Joint Force Space Component Commander, and Brigadier General Chris McKenna, who is the Director General Air and Space Force Development. And last but by no means least from UK, and you've already heard from him this morning, uh, Air Vice Marshal Paul Godfrey, the commander of UK Space Command. So before we get started, just a few ground rules for how I will try to chair uh, uh, this panel. Uh, if I may, I'll ask each of the panelists to give us about five minutes or so, which normally equals about seven minutes, but uh, there's the challenge, first challenge, five minutes or so just on allied by design and where you see the challenges associated with collaboration uh, and particularly the inevitable opportunities. Um, I fully expect that this will undoubtedly get the juices flowing in the audience and then we'll go straight into what should amount to about 30 minutes worth of Q&A, taking us right up until 1500 when I will, as a good chairman, get us finished on time so that we can go off and have a little bit more coffee for the rest of the afternoon. I, I will try my best to do the usual balance of questions from within the room. Don't be shy. I know you haven't been thus far. And also online, and my able assistant, uh, Commander Sandy, there at the back, is uh, doing the juggling of the online questions. So without further ado, and with those ground rules set, and an opportunity for me, for once, to do less talking and a bit more listening, it's over to our panel uh, and I'll start with Australia, if I may. Over to you, Chris. Yeah, thank you, sir. And I'm going to pick up on a few things from that uh, intro, if I may. The first being, I'm hoping this isn't a debate, more collegiate than that. But similarly, unlike the Canadians, my face is for radio, so I'm not <laughs> looking tight. But uh, inherently, this is putting me outside of that comfort zone. Uh, and that comfort zone might have been me to talk about myself, but that wouldn't be of any relevance to this audience. And so... Rather than going and falling on that comfort zone, I am going to try and fall back to that relevance um, perspective. And, and it's on that theme that the Australian Defence Space Command was formed uh, on the 22nd of February this year, so quite new. But our space strategy was similarly released uh, in the same month. And it's within that strategy that this topic really is encompassed being allied by design. And there's two lines of effort akin to what was already heard through the UK's strategy. That the first of ours is to really enhance defence-based capability, and that's through the second. 
which is to deliver those military effects through an integrated and across whole of government and with allied and partner approach. So our strategy is acknowledging straight up that we're not doing this alone. And I think that's really important. But there's one word that I really want to harness on within that second line of effort being integrated. And that term integrated, thereby slightly tweaking from an allied by design becomes integrated by design. And so what does that really mean? And thankfully we heard from, again, General Dickinson, who went to a point of defining that for us with joint, combined and partnered, and what that truly means in, in his eyes. And so for us, we need to actually understand that as we move through what is now a very embryonic trajectory moving forward. So how do we get to this point of integrated and understanding what that means? Well, inherently we're going through a process and that process is our space capability architecture review. And that's gonna be working across all of our Australian Hall of Government resources to make sure we understand all those touch points that we're importantly reaching in, influencing or acting within the space domain. And then it will continue and it will continue to broaden from an architecture's design and understanding perspective um, out. The challenges and the opportunities point was mentioned by our very handsome moderator. And this being through an understanding, Les, we actually hope to shift again that word away from challenge. We hope to shift that towards gaps and opportunities as opposed to challenge and opportunities. Because Australia is keen to become a contributor, moving away from what has typically been seen as a consumer. So the gaps and the opportunities is that lens through which we can start to do that. And it then starts to provide that greater clarity of the word integrated, because it means a lot more than just capabilities, training, processes, interoperability, and more to then understanding and acknowledging that holistically this space community is small, and that we don't have the resources, we were highlighted that it's expensive, but enables us then to understand where those gaps are and where can we actually be putting our national treasure towards so that we're meaningfully contributing to where it's needed. And so I sense that this really becomes that opportunity because in some certain bespoke capabilities, duplication of our resources might in turn actually be fratricide. You know, I'm inherently cognizant that national caveats exist. But they exist for the right reasons. It's how you apply them that probably matters more than the fact that they're there. Applying them in a judicial manner is absolutely appropriate for all of our governments and our military services. But I think I could extrapolate that a little further. If I tell you that I'm holding a national caveat card, then just in that act of telling the community, not just other militaries, but everyone across that joint combined and partnered approach, integrated approach, then that in itself is a trust building activity. And it's through the trust that we're actually getting bound closer together. So in the context of how I started this five minute introduction, the key for me, sir, is that uh, as we move forward, I want you to ask where are you comfortable or where do we need to be relevant? Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll just keep going across the line. Over to you. Sure, it's great. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, AVM Harv and AVM Goddard, for, uh, for inviting us. Certainly having two Canadians up here is probably two more than uh, you might normally see, but I think it's important to have both sides of the coin, which is uh, the force development side, which is my realm, and the operational side, which is Mike's. So much like the Australians, we have sort of cleaved that off now based on complexity and volume. Um, you know, we're a small military. Uh, large, large Canadian landmass, obviously, um, and a long uh, space ferry nation. Unsurprising to you might be the fact that our first foray into space was in the 1970s to broadcast ice hockey signals <laughs> ac across ca across Canada, and it really started uh, and started and built quite significantly from there. Um, you know, but really, we're we're, we're um, as I said, a small military, but we want to bring a credible. Uh, a credible capability of the alliance, and I think that is key. And what, so the quick key question is, you know, what is the value proposition of your nation to bring uh, credibility and capability to the alliance and ensure that we are integratable des by design from requirements being set uh, to contracts being let to uh, launch occurring in, insofar as uh, you, can, you can make specific choices to be, uh, to be a partner and to, uh, and to be able to move data between um, key allies. Um, I think the second aspect that I think Canada, Canada needs to be looking at is agility in that mission partner environment. 
The United States, in, in very many ways, sets the rules, and we have a very strong binational relationship in the NORAD agreement with them. And I think it's very um, mature to understand that that mission partner environment is going to be set by, uh, by them and making sure that the way that you structure your data, the way that you structure uh, the capabilities you're going to invest in is aligned specifically into that mission partner environment and that you can um, be synchronized uh, by design. So Canada uh, is in the process of a pretty substantial uh, look at our defense capability, not unlike an integrated review. So you would, might recall that there was a, a defense policy review in 2017 that, that really upped uh, our defense um, expenditures. And the unwritten chapter of that what was called Strong, Secure, Engaged. The unwritten chapter was really the NORAD uh, Continental Defense upgrade and mandate. And that has been, it essentially stole my summer and my entire year. And so we have been writing furiously against, uh, against our advice to government on that. And that is now uh, you know, up for decision. But concurrent to that, if you are a Canada watcher, and I doubt very many of you are, but if you are one, uh, our federal budget released uh, a defense policy update. So we are formalizing the work that we are doing this year into an update that is occurring uh, very rapidly. <laughs> so rapidly, I may not have been here this week, but it's, uh, it's ongoing uh, as we speak. And really to look at the change situation, the changing situation in the geostrategic environment with uh, what is happening with the Ukraine and great power competition. Really three lines of effort in our force development uh, mandate. One is clearly space domain awareness as, as priority one. We, we have had an asset in space, Sapphire, since 2013. Uh, it is delivered human service, but it needs to be recapitalized. And I think the key recognition is that it must be a program of work in that you are actually looking to um, set the requirements and move out on procurement of its replacement before it even launches. So that is a, a significant body of work for us. Canada's, as I mentioned, the geostrategic position, the, the polar SATCOM reality, the plus 65 to plus 90 or zero, whatever you want to call it, the North Pole, in terms of making sure you can get protected mill secure uh, SATCOM uh, to enable the, really the 10 and 2 o'clock defense of North America, which has clearly a NATO alliance on the seam of the, uh, the, east, the western side of, of, uh, of the European theater. Uh, and then lastly, surveillance from, from space. We've had uh, radar sat constellation mission, truly a dual use uh, satellite constellation that we've collaborated with Space Agency on. Uh, but we have now matured to the point where we believe there needs to be a bit of a bifurcation in terms of, um, you know, I don't need to look at ice and whales as much as I need to look at dark ships. And so we think we probably need to look at what that looks like going forward. Um, you know, and it, and it, quite honestly, in times of crises that we've just experienced, I think the most striking thing for us was to watch how quickly the Allies moved to declassify and to share it with our Ukrainian brothers and sisters across every one of uh, the members of the Alliance and, and many who aren't even represented here today. And I think that really does show maturity in, that, in the way that we deal with each other and the, and the sanctity of the military to military relationship that we all enjoy that transcends political uh, stripes left and right, and you're allowed to have a conversation across alliances in a very mature way at all times. You know, I listened to the own Collaborate um, and Access uh, discussion. I've clearly read the strategy. That's just my plug. Um, but you know, I think about our own situation, and we've invested heavily into like AHF and, and WGS SATCOM over the years. We've invested heavily into our own sovereign uh, space domain awareness, uh, but it's the Collaborate piece that, quite honestly, Canada has missed. And I think there's, a, there's quite a bit of opportunity in there. And I, as, I, as I consider all of the programs we have moving right now, um, the lack of discussion, mature discussion on collaboration that exists around them, I think is really important to sort of acknowledge now and maybe, uh, maybe remedy. And I will just leave you with sort of two questions. And I think this is what the, the questions that allies need to ask themselves. And the first is, you know, what is the value proposition that your geostrategic position and geographic position can offer in the space domain to the alliance? And I think all of us, Australia has their position in the world, our, like the actual physical location, as, as, as does Canada. And we can offer certainly some advantages from where we sit and the, and the uh, uninhabited land we own. Uh, and, the, and the last is, uh, what are the key industrial and commercial capabilities your, your country has organic to it uh, that, are, that have been developed through, uh, through a variety of reasons, either organically or by design, that you can be leveraged or, pardon the term, weaponized uh, to be able to use in, in support of, of an alliance effect? Uh, and that's all I'd say. I'd hand over to my uh, much better looking friend who can talk to you about operations. And, uh, Mike. Right. So thank you, Chris and Chris. And that's, that's all I had. That's, um, <laughs> uh, that's, that's all my notes. Um, no, I think uh, if I was to sort of launch into a description of the Canadian context in terms of a, an organization, um, Canada similarly going through a maturing process in its uh, space enterprise. Um, unlike our, our British and Australian comrades who have stood up Space Command, we're doing it differently. We're standing up a space division. Um, but uh, the same type of idea, um, basically institutionalizing those capabilities and then, uh, and then making sure that we are 
able to provide effect for Canadian Forces operations around the world and at home. So uh, again, very similar mission set, but we can't do it alone. And I'm not the first person today that will quote General uh, Jay Raymond to say space is hard. Um, very few people can go it alone. I think there is absolute value in, in the collaborative efforts. I think you need to put together the combined horsepower of allies. And, uh, and to that end, I would say allied by design is certainly the way we're going forward, but perhaps allied by imperative is the way we must look at it because there is absolute value in putting together a coalition of like-minded nations and then combining their various uh, capabilities and bringing them to bear. I would think that a similar conference like this in either Moscow or Beijing would have a lot fewer international participants uh, and perhaps a different tone to it. Um, you know, the, the fact that within five Five Eyes or CSPO or greater than that in NATO, that we have an alliance of like-minded nations that can bring both uh, the ability to leverage the, the high ground, uh, the operational high ground of space, but the moral high ground of having an alliance uh, to counter things like what's going on in Ukraine right now is uh, absolutely speaks volumes to the value of alliance and why by design that is absolutely the way we need to move forward. And to that end, you know, I think every nation brings forward their niche capabilities. Certainly Canada's got industrial capacity uh, in very specific areas. Uh, and I know that Australia, UK, and others have got uh, similar niche cap capacity. Um, so yeah, it's a complementary effort in design um, in order to work alliances uh, so that we're not repeating um, and, and being redundant in terms of what we're doing, but rather complementary in how we approach that. So those are my thoughts. Is there anything left for you to say? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike, Chris, and Chris. Um, so from my perspective, you, clearly you've had my 30-minute pitch uh, this morning uh, anyway, but um, you know, Harv and I had a quick discussion the other day, is there a pitch involved in this? And I thought I would go last as, uh, as I had spoken previously. Um, but it's interesting, we did not collaborate on the sort of uh, the notes and things that we were gonna talk about, but there's definitely a few key themes that come out of it. From my perspective, the need for collaboration, you know, I think we've talked uh, all about that. When we talk about some of our potential adversaries and the capability that we have, we are behind in certain areas already, and that is the collective we uh, as well. I think it's worth noting, as others have, you know, the US is definitely the lead in the uh, allied uh, collective um, uh, global coalition for space, um, and therefore, there is an onus on us to ensure that, you know, uh, Chris, you mentioned small military. Um, when you are looking at that big US machine, that no matter how small the cog that we are building right now is, that we make sure it goes into the right place and is, uh, makes that machine more efficient. Because if we don't do that, it's gonna create fiction, uh, friction and the entire machine um, is gonna fall apart. So that's what an awful lot of us are doing at the moment, is just trying to understand a, how to build that cog, B, where we're going to, uh, to put it. Um, in terms of the blockers that I thought I'd mention, uh, classification um, is clearly probably the first thing that we, uh, that we come up against. I mean, more than you heard just from a quick bio, 30 years of flying, but um, I've never come up against as much classification as, as I have in the, uh, in the space domain, primarily because of where it started in you know, proper strategic um, issues. Um, there are always going to be barriers, you know, from the eyes only, no foreign, uh, and that side of things. And um, uh, it, it, the, unfortunately, it doesn't make it easy to understand. If I'm looking to develop a capability that I've just classified, how can I then have the, co the conversation with my colleagues here to understand whether they're already developing that, co that, uh, that capability? Um, and if I actually need to go and spend money somewhere else because they've got it, you know, that is the hardest thing to, uh, to be able to do. Um, complexity. I think all of us are finding in the, in the multi-domain operations world that Finn talked about there, that uh, they're actually enabled by space. Um, but these are all complex programs and who do you connect to, who do you connect, or when do you connect, um, and what other space control or whatever it happens to be, space domain awareness um, uh, capabilities do you, need to, uh, do you need to bring to the fight. Um, it's hard enough doing it in our own militaries without the international collaboration. So it is vital that we are part of forums such as the, uh, the CSPO forum and NATO, but clearly the more nations that you bring to the party, the more difficult it is to collaborate with every single one. Um, incompatibility, uh, I think interfaces and standards are key right from the very beginning. Now we're not gonna be able to solve everything on this particular front, but uh, I, I mentioned in a previous conference, I think, if you go back to data links in the mid 90s, you know, the classic example was the Dutch with Apache and F-16, for example, both had VMF, variable message format uh, data link, 
but they had different protocols and they couldn't speak to each other. That's, again, within a single air force, let alone uh, a coalition uh, or a collaboration of, uh, of many nations. Um, one thing, I was the camp director out at Al Udeed for, uh, for six months, um, about 18 months ago, and one of the critical assets out there was the BACON, the Battlefield Air Communications Node, which was essentially the flying translator or Babelfish, for those of you that have seen uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, I did think when putting a couple of notes together for this that maybe Space Bacon, TM, <laughs> um, is, is something that, I mean, genuinely may get us round some of the issues of having to provide all of these interfaces and standards. But I did notice that uh, the Space Development Agency, um, who are developing the proliferated LEO uh, data transport layer, have already put their interfaces and standards online. And I think we just, it comes back to classification, we just need to be open. Um, I think individuals come into this as well, in that all of us want to collaborate from the very beginning. Um, and tour lengths are one of those things that, that can affect that as new people come in, they haven't got the background and so on. So how do we continue those, uh, those collaborations when specific individuals move out, of, uh, uh, move out of roles? Maybe it's longer tour lengths, I don't know, um, in this particular area. Um, but uh, there is definitely something in that. If I go back to uh, General Dickinson, US Space Command, um, it is the individuals in there that have opened the doors to us, uh, specifically General Dickinson and also uh, Admiral uh, Mike Bernanke in the J5 area, who's, who's welcomed our exchange officer, Paul Tedman, with open arms uh, on that particular front. Um, there's also a thing on there in terms of, um, we could look at MOUs and so on, but what is, what do we just need to get going in the, uh, in the first place? And I'm sure that will come up in, uh, in questions. Um, and I'll just finish off with, uh, with opportunities. Um, all of us in CSPO, as an example, have collaborated before in some way, shape, or form. So we may not have to rely on MOUs or so on. We can just get on with some of these things using frameworks uh, that we've previously got. Um, all of us are pretty much starting from the same baseline if we look at with space divisions, space uh, commands, uh, or France three years ago with their Space Command. Um, we are looking at the US for leadership, and I mentioned Deanna Riles earlier as one of those individuals that's providing leadership from a Space Systems Command perspective uh, to bring us all together in order for us to, uh, uh, for us to collaborate. Um, within that CSPO, we're developing a Command Space Capabilities MOU that will allow us some freedoms to, uh, to operate together. And I think I'll pause there just so I don't go on for the 15 minutes, uh, as you've already heard me for 30. But I think as much as there are blockers, there are so many opportunities, especially as we all start this journey together. Brilliant. Thanks to the panel. Uh, very insightful uh, inputs. Uh, and actually, I worried that there would just be four people saying the same things, and that's not what we've had. So uh, I'm very grateful for that. Um, I've scribbled a few notes, and I'll maybe try and sum up uh, some of the key points from the discussion on the panel right at the end. But I'm keen, uh, whilst the juices are flowing, to get uh, stuck straight into Q&A. So uh, let's start here in the room um, and just raise your hand if you've got a question, and then we'll go from there. OK, gentlemen here on the middle row. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, Neil Fraser from NSSL. I've got a question about architectures, which will surprise Rick Greenwood. Um, not the question, the fact I'm talking about it. Um, so um, there's a lot of US Space Force design around architectures and hybrid constellations and MEO, GEO and LEO. Um, it's great you're all here together. I suspect you'll go back to your various offices and get back on your whiteboard to design your own architecture. Um, so um, uh, Air Vice Marshal uh, Godfrey's mentioned the, the CIC and the companies that deliver CONSAT to UK MOD. We leverage multiple constellations as it is. They're all integrated by the company I work with, NSSL Global, in support of Airbus. Um, but linking to John Reed's comment earlier about access is best done if you've collaborated and designed an architecture so we can have a sort of allied architecture that can plug and play Starlink, um, Microsoft, uh, Telesatellite Speed, OneWeb, all the future constellations and the planned geos. Is there an effort to do that coherently across allies? Or does each nation go in its own way and hoping that they'll turn up on the day? Sorry, long transmission, but you get the gist. Uh, no, good question. Uh, anyone want to volunteer to start, or shall I go the other way around and start with you, Goddard? Uh, you know, from my perspective, it comes back to the point, Neil, that, uh, that I made that we're at the beginning of the journey here. So if we don't do this, 
um, we have blown it. There is the difficulty of, um, so if, we, if I talked about Titania this morning and the laser optical links. Um, there's only so many things that we can do to ensure that that is compatible. But I think, as I talked about in the way that SDA are doing it, actually getting your data out there and understanding what your interfaces and, and standards are um, has to be the, uh, the starting point for all of these. Um, certainly one of the things, actually, in order to make it five minutes, I had a couple of notes on this. Um, but it was amazing to me to go down to Australia at the opening of the um, Space Command and get a briefing from their DST group on Starshot, which is amazingly similar to what I talked about this morning, what Michael Callahan will talk about tomorrow, um, in terms of a, a, a LEO constellation that's doing ISR. Why wouldn't we collaborate uh, on that particular front? Why, would not, why wouldn't we ensure that these things can work together and maybe even task together? And one of the things that we're doing uh, with Mike and the team is trying to get to a point early this year, we just missed out because of some financial issues at the back end of last year, but has allowed them access to be able to task Vision One uh, through our Artemis program, um, so that we're already demonstrated that in international by design and, uh, and giving these guys the ability to, uh, to do that. So I think it is an advantage of not having the full clean whiteboard in front of us, but actually starting from very much the same point. Yeah, and I'll offer that uh, certainly the capabilities and architecture working group within CSPO is one that has probably one of the greater challenges in trying to find those common baselines uh, and standards um, in order to sort of simplify just basic communications across, you know, five plus two eyes. Um, to that end, I think Canada has a bit of an advantage in so far as we draw upon 50 or 60 years of NORAD experience, especially tied into the space enterprise in the south. Obviously, NORAD with the missile warning and missile defense mandate and a significant Canadian contribution both in the U.S. and in Canada, we have a lot of those systems in place those networks and, and communications nodes that will facilitate that but uh, obviously you know you need to you need to be able to bridge that across a wider breadth of participants um, in order to be able to share that command and control piece you know and as Goddard was just saying you know we're looking at working with the uh, with the UK on, on something that does just exactly that over the next little while um, so that would be my observations Chris we've got more nothing further okay that was Chris no so I mean you heard that we're doing that space capability architecture review and it hits at the question so we hope to learn more what's the time scale on your Architecture really. Yeah, I think it's got to be delivered by the end of the year. Okay, great. Uh, should we go to one online, Dave? Have you got something you want to? Uh, thank, thanks, sir. Um, so there's some great questions coming in, and I think this is a panel question, and it's a bit of uh, you might you might want to direct who answers first. But where you have companies with a footprint in each of your countries. How can they better support Allied by Design or be integrated by Design to deliver combined 24-7, 365 sustainable capability to military operations? Do you want to start, Chris? So I'm, I might have missed the nuance of the question. I apologize. So I think what, a, what a, I've just seen this pop up. Pete, Peter Wright, is he in the room? Do you want to, uh, do you want to amplify a little bit to the panel? Thanks. Uh, sorry. Uh, Peter Wright. Um, in the room, you'll, you'll have a number of companies that'll have uh, footprints in each of the nations you represent uh, and, and others. What can they do by the nature of their presence to help you with the allied by design or integrated mm. by design? Okay. Conscious that across the time zones, you can hit that 24-7, 365, follow the SOM capability that you see in other industries. Okay. Yeah, so I think that there's a couple of things there. Is as we start to run and understand each other's capabilities and our requirements, and I think there's a piece there in between, is that I heard a, a really interesting professional development piece uh, not so long ago, which actually said that part of the problem with industry working with the military is that we're so slow. We're too big, we're so slow, and we don't adapt. We're not as agile. We like to espouse it, but we don't do it. And then, then when you're an agile company and you're producing and you're at the front edge of technology, and you just want to keep being there, you don't want to be pulled back at the pace of us. So in, there could be another flip to that, which is you introduce a technology and it can do certain things. Is there a process or is there a piece of us that needs to change as opposed to the other way around, you fitting into us? There might be something that we need to change to make that work because that couldn't be the next big thing. Hey, Chris. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think it's really useful for us as well in Canada. So. Um, our procurement structure is a bit different than most, and we have sort of this three-headed hydra, um, one of which is D&D looking, or defense, which is looking obviously for lethality and overmatch, 
you have fair and open competition from our procurement folks and our industry Canada folks who are looking for obviously industrial and economic benefits for Canada. And so that, that three-headed hydro is quite a complex place to navigate and I think it frustrates industry to know and I have some Canadian colleagues in here who might echo that. Uh, I would just say um, sort of two things. I guess the first is, um, I, I believe we need to look at competing partnerships instead of projects and sort of itemizing the things you're, like if you're gonna buy an aircraft, you're gonna specify the high level mandatories and, and say, I wanna buy this and build, please go build this. As opposed to, I have a problem, I would like to contract a relationship with an industry partner and then we can get after the problem together. That has not occurred yet, to my knowledge. And I think that would be very useful, especially in the space domain. And then the second part of it would be really basic, which is everything is moving into, at very least, the secret, if not TS, uh, SCI realm. And, and the industrial base needs to also up its game to that realm. As all of us build skiffs madly in our, in our countries to try and accommodate uh, the workforce that has to be cleared to TS and compartments, um, so does industry. And, and what is the incentivization minus a contract for industry to do that? Uh, I think the, the value proposition is if you wish to compete for some of the big projects that are coming, uh, you, you must have a cleared workforce and a cleared workspace. And so I think that is very fundamental, maybe oversimplified, but it's really important. Thanks, Chris Goddard. Um, just to point out that, um, again, one of the things that I didn't say was about, it, one of the blockers is the sort of sovereign uh, aspect of this and wanting to build things in your own uh, country. But I think it does make it a lot easier with the multinationals that um, it can be sovereign in two places at once. Yeah. In that it could be a British product, but it's also a Canadian product and it's also an Australian product. And I think that in itself, makes a huge difference um, when it comes to, uh, to being able to collaborate on that side. And just to pick up on, uh, on Chris's point, the industry side of things, we had a, on the 31st of March, um, we had a, an industry day, some of you in the room were there, but we were talking about exactly those things. So how do we give problems that you guys then give us solutions to? Because if, if I give you a set of requirements right now based on uh, the defense space portfolio that was uh, handed across to us, then they'll be out of date, well, as we've seen from the, uh, I think the curve that John Reeves put up, they'll be out of date tomorrow. You know, so how do we just give you the problems, you provide us the, uh, the solutions, and if you're providing a solution in this particular country, then there is undoubtedly a solution in the other country, uh, in the other country as well. Um, so I, I, I'll pause there on that particular front, but I think there's, there are definitely benefits in the, uh, in the multinationals. You also need to bring the smaller companies with you so that we can use everything at our disposal. Mike, are you? No, that's good. So Peter, I think I saw you're from Thales. So you're working in one of those companies. What do you think? Uh, well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Turn around, yeah. Nice. <laughs> Time to think. I think a lot of this contributes to a, a path that will get to the answer to this. I don't think there is a ready-made, here we go, here's a solution. I think understanding Coming back to that classification cleared stuff, where that sits against the comment earlier about, was it a thousand to one ratio of commercial owned satellites to government owned, and they may not be operating cleared personnel, so how does that work when the commercial open CNN feeds are getting more than the classified feeds? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of complexity in that, and whether you need that international in each company, where you could have a cleared sale of each of the nations in each country. Uh, and they just establish that trust mechanism, but are supported by the industry that can then work through that in each of the, in each of the time zones as you're working through and think of it more of a, a time zone challenge rather than a country or a national yeah. challenge. Yeah, yeah, we're really good, thanks. Big, big topic, sorry. Yeah, yeah I didn't mean to put you back on the spot, but you know, there's a, there's a two way here and it's really interesting to hear your, your view. If it's on your mind to ask the question, then I will assume you've obviously got some thoughts on it yourself. And um, I think just personally, what's interesting is the comment around the, uh, does everyone raise their game up to be at the TS level? Or do we work in a way where we can all come to the lowest common denominator? And there's a sweet spot in there somewhere, isn't there? And um, I think that's something certainly we've been juggling. I, in, in the UK, we call it getting a DV, develop vetting, it costs a lot of money, takes quite a bit of time, and actually there are not that many people that are qualified to get people through that process, so it becomes a really big ask. 
And um, so we could find that just that process becomes the hindrance. And actually, we need to look at how do we push it down so that we can get more people to work. But it's a great observation uh, because many times, from personal experience, these things uh, were stopped by the process, not by the capability, which is uh, slightly frustrating. But OK, uh, back to the room. We've got one here. Enthusiastic. Uh, this is Richie Consulting. Uh, so AVM um, Harv Smith talked about uh, collaboration allied by design. There are, there are very big words. Obviously, implementation is a whole uh, different thing altogether and a big challenge. What will all of you commit to doing today to, in practice, ensure that you truly are allied by design? Thank you. Mike, you're looking pensive, so yeah, we'll go to you first. Perfect, great, great what, target. What will, I, what will I commit to today? Uh, I will commit to you that Chris will do a great job uh, in, in procuring um, allied by design. I, you know, I think for us, and I go back to my original point, it is, it is, a, it is an, a factual, it's imperative for Canada to be able to operate in a, in a coalition and alliance framework. Um, we are never going to enter a conflict on our own. Certainly, we're going to do it with our, uh, with our allies and partners. So, you know, everything that we have done to this point in terms of our, our armed forces has been, you know, with an eye towards um, interoperability, whether it be data link systems or radio systems or shared munition systems or what have you across land, sea and air, um, you know, and space is no different in terms of the requirement to be, um, you know, interoperable and in, in, in that regard, um, but because the, the, the enormity of the domain and the enormity of the, the mission set uh, is more, like I said, than any one nation can really hope to do by itself. It really has to be um, a complementary effort um, from the get-go, you know, and it was mentioned by uh, the U.S. a year ago that they were talking to the Allies and said, you know, don't bring me 50 more of something I already have 500 of, you know, whether it be, you know, PNT or what have you. Um, if you're going to come to the table, um, bring something that is you know going to be of value to all of us that we're all going to be able to leverage and I think we need to take that deliberate approach uh, into our program and uh, and move out on things that are going to be value added and to that end communication is going to be crucial between you know the, the three here uh, the US five eyes the CSPO organizations and what have you um, so I will commit to you uh, that we will continue to uh, <laughs> to certainly look at uh, allied by design as we move forward it's it's always been our way in certainly the Canadian context and I'm sure Australia would probably say this same thing, but I'll go to Yeah, and I think that the key, look, some things will need to be sovereign, and we're going to have to develop that capability, but realistically, it's understanding those gaps with the valued contribution that we can then make as part of the whole team. And you heard uh, space is a team sport, so I'll just reiterate that one. But it, realistically, the domain represents a hell of a lot more in terms of the opportunity to do that collaborative behaviour. I mean, of all of them, this one domain represents the largest opportunity to do that and to get after it as part of its inception through our embryonic commands that we're establishing now. So realistically, that's an eyes wide open approach so that we can do it and do it right as we start to move forward. It's um, coming from an armoured and a ground uh, centric background. You know, I can tell you the benefits of getting in all the other combined arms natures to achieve an effect at a point in time. In fact, we've seen the effect of just tanks rolling down the streets of Ukraine as a highly negative example where it hasn't been partnered, integrated with infantry engineers, uh, joint fires, combat support, combat service support. I mean, it's the integration of everything that then makes that an effect in place and time um, to do its job. For space, we're after that right now. And we're trying to understand that across all of us and try to fill those gaps, find those niche areas where we can contribute uh, that's going to be meaningful. Let me just add an addendum to the Canadian position because I think it's, so first of all, it feels like a, like a timeshare sales pitch and I'm like, I mean, forced to commit. Um, but I think the position I would take is, you know, in, in, in Canada, we have this conceive, design, build, manage architecture for force development. And I think we all probably have something similar. Um, and I think that, that there's, a, there's a step zero that is never stated, which is aligned to allies, conceive, design, build, manage. And that has not occurred by, des by design. I think we need to acknowledge that as a start point as we march down the path to conceive. That's, that's what, it's a missing element right now because we'll find ourselves with very mature in options analysis, let's say, of a project, and all of a sudden realizing there's duplication, there's overlap, there's actually con contradictory capability uh, being fielded. And I think that's way too late. It needs to be in the identification phase and, and well in advance. Okay, Cutters? Um, uh, so I, the, the two things, I can't really see there, Tahita, but um, 
I think we've already committed to, you know, right at the stand up of the command, I said the command culture was to be joint and collaborative. So we're committing to be collaborative right in the first place. Um, and I think as part of that, there's probably two specifics. One is that we'll be open and honest with, uh, with everyone, you know, and uh, certainly that's, I really do feel that amongst the, you know, the team on the stage here. Um, and the broader teams, uh, especially when we meet in, the, uh, in that CSPO forum. And so, you know, understanding that, frankly, I can't collaborate there because of whether it's a sovereign commitment is just as good as, yeah, yeah, we can do it uh, in the future. So I think open and honest. And the other thing, Harv was alluding to it there, is not to overclassify things. Um, someone mentioned something really interesting the other day about how, in general, we will stamp eyes only and then work it down from there. Um, whereas actually the onus should be to classify it in the first place. So we start with unclass and then work out if there is a reason that we need to classify. So the onus is on the individual to classify up to that particular level. Um, so I think with those two things, which we have already committed to, um, then uh, you know, I think that'll just engender that collaborative uh, culture um, that uh, we definitely want. Good, that enough, enough commitment for you? <laughs> Good. Hi, uh, Dave, shall we go to one online? Certainly, sir. So, Graham McKay from uh, L3 Harris, could the panel say something on resourcing their space plants and engaging the other domains and the benefits of space based capabilities? Mm. Good question. Yep. Want to start? Uh, thanks, sir. So, uh, as part of our defence strategic update, uh, which was leveraging some of the analysis of our four structure plan, the government had agreed to a 17 billion. Uh, investment in a space over 10 years, and that's part of the, the strategy. So that fundamentally, I hope, answers the, the commitment piece from a Australian government perspective. Uh, and a lot of that, yes, will go into the analysis, understanding you know, what is going to be a sovereign, what is going to be a gap fill, and how we can contribute, not just be a consumer, uh, as I alluded to before. But inherently, that's, that's the key part. What was the second inference to the question? So that was about um, how we develop and communicate requirements of space technologies across the domains. Yeah, and I think we've spoken a little bit about that already, which is you know, through that understanding phase, there needs to be a two-way street, understand what's available, but also to the requirement piece, because it comes to other questions inherently about resilience, how you're trying to develop resilience within the domain, and what does that really mean? Uh, is it going for that one-shot wonder in GEO where it does exquisite capabilities, but in itself is sitting there on its own? Is that what we're talking about? We're putting protections on the system or is mass resilience in itself? So, you know, there's a different way to look at it, but it's the requirement, the effect, and then let's together look for the solutions across the community. Yeah, the, the Canadian side for the space plan, I mean, this was, it was um, announced inside of Strong, Secure, Engage back in 17, but I think we've learned a great deal in the last five years and then have a new imperative now as a result of the conflict in the Ukraine. And so I do think that uh, there's been about more than 10 billion committed across 20 years for really three key projects, or a surveillance of space project, defense enhanced surveillance from space and a, and a polar SATCOM uh, project. I think what's happening now though, in the continental defense modernization view, all of those are being relooked in terms of resourcing to make sure that we are investing in the right places and with sufficient resources to make sure that they're, they're, uh, they're, they're gonna be credible and interoperable. So there is a, a body of work ongoing that I won't comment on, but uh, other than to say there's, there's a, a a good amount of momentum using the NORAD modernization, continental defense modernization rubric for Canada. Coffers? Um, uh, yeah, there's a couple of things in there for me. In terms of the resourcing, it comes back to open and honest. I think we've been open and honest uh, with all of you in terms of the resource that we have available uh, to do this. And you know, certainly Harv and the team um, have put that in black and white in our defense space strategy of, uh, of how much is out there. Um, I'm trying to read the, uh, the other notes that, uh, that I put in there on that. In terms of the other domains, the, um, you know, as part of the roller coaster, the heck of a year that I talked about, it has been about getting out to the other domains. Not as evangelists, it's about being advocates for space. Because if I kick the door open and go, it's all right, space is here, they're going to ask me what I've got. Right now, not a huge amount, but I've got a friend over the Atlantic. Um, who has got a large amount. So I think it's about being realistic, it's about being open and honest, and it's about being brokers, if you like. So if we are now the experts in the space domain, and I was speaking to Rear Admiral uh, James Parkin just earlier, who's uh, running the capability and the future side for the Royal Navy, if we can get the right people in the room to give a demo of something that is enabled by space, then we just let them run. We're just doing that match.com. 
um, side of things uh, that we need to do. So I think there's a couple of things in terms of, uh, of resource. I'll remember what the, uh, the other one was. I mentioned that portfolio approach. So we don't have a huge amount of money, but I think what we do with it is really, really important. And certainly with Chief of the Air Staff, uh, who is delegating to me this year, the, uh, the budget that we have for, for this year, it is about being able, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to flex that money between the various programs that we have in order to make the best use of that money and not throw good after bad uh, on the, you know, one of the programs that is, is delayed or whatever it happens to be. So I think that's, that's how we resource this properly. Okay, brilliant. Uh, in the room? Oh, I'll go, I'll go here because you had one earlier, so I'm trying to be fair. Let's go here, and then I'll and then I'll come to you. Oh, there we go. We beat you to it. Defence journalist. Um, yeah, my question is um, about. Uh, you look at um, each sovereign nation has its own defence budgets and um, aspirations, not only in space. Um, and we talk about allied by design and, and keeping the group moving forward. How much do you think? Um, or how, what is your opinion about bringing politicians internationally across and making them understand where the group needs to go in terms of that allied push forward? You. Happy with that? Who wants to start? There's, there's pensive and ca Canadian pensiveness. Yeah. Goddard's? Perfect. Oh, so go straight to me. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I, I, I think the commitment that, uh, you know, certainly the government has made over here, it makes that statement in the first place. Um, you know, we know in the various forums that, um, you know, whether it's procurement ministers, whether it's defense ministers, um, talk a lot, and they are talking about space a lot. Um, and so actually, when we talk about the collaboration and so on, it is starting at the very top in terms of, uh, in terms of governance, uh, governments. And... Um, one of the blockers that I put in there was uh, that I, I didn't get to was uh, was COVID, and being able to meet face to face. And uh, certainly, our ministers, from a, a defence perspective, have been out and about around the world talking to their equivalents in order to uh, in order to get out there post COVID and have those proper conversations about how we might uh, collaborate in the uh, in, in the future. So I think certainly from a UK perspective, it we're involved straight from the top through all of the team in the Space Directorate and down to the delivery area uh, for us in UK Space Command. I think in the Canadian context it might be a bit of a challenge and, and certainly I look at the what you've done in the UK uh, with a certain amount of envy starting with the Blackett Report in 2018 and then um, you know a National uh, Space Council and a National Space Policy Strategy uh, from which then you can underpin your defence space strategy which, which is brilliant I think that's absolutely the way to do it. Um, it's not been a fulsome societal or political discussion in Canada to this point uh, in terms of looking at the ubiquity of space and what would what it would mean to the Canadian uh, economy and to Canadian society to have a day without space as Black Report did. Um, that's part of what I'm you know, efforting at the moment uh, back home is to sort of get that discussion going to sort of increase the awareness, uh, not just within the Canadian Armed Forces, but really from a, a wider discussion to, to work with industry and, and, and get that word out, make people aware of, of what exactly is at risk and why it's important to be able to talk about it. Um, but it hasn't happened to this point. So leveraging political uh, masters uh, to, to be able to work uh, across uh, the political spectrum might be a little bit more difficult for us at the moment, but uh, yeah. So I think the formation of Defence Based Command Australia wouldn't have been uh, possible without you know, the full support of our ministers. And so it was probably that awakening that really was the impetus behind the establishment. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, you know, we've experienced quite a, a demand for information where you know, our senior officers are going across to deliver you know, space briefs directly to the Defence Minister particularly um, to enable counterpart discussions. So it's absolutely on the mind. Mm -hmm. I think just from a personal perspective, I haven't been on this journey for a couple of years. What was key for us was one of the very early discussions that we had into number 10, as the, our new National Space Council was just starting to find its feet. Uh, and a couple of things. One was the Prime Minister asking, what could this look like in 10 years time? And we laid out a realistic journey of what that could be, which ultimately ended up informing a national space strategy and a defence space strategy. But the other thing that was really key was uh, making sure that from the PM and those other key ministers on the National Space Council, 
that we got them an appropriate classified space threats brief. And that, that was a turning point for us when we could, you could hear the pennies drop when we had that discussion. And that really brought a renewed uh, focus and determination and a seriousness about it, something that had previously been out of sight, out of mind in many ways, had been brought to life. Uh, and just getting that view from right at the top of government really helped us just take everything else through, to be completely honest. Um, that's, that's certainly my personal experience, but we had a, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, we've got an, another one down here, if you don't mind, Dave. Um, and we'll, we'll try to perhaps make this the last one and then do a quick sum up and get out to coffee, if that's okay. Um, yeah, hi there, Tim Robinson, uh, Aerospace Magazine. Um, for new stroke emerging space powers with a small number of professionals, personnel, how are you balancing, uh, you know, growing your cadre internally and then maybe sending all these, these people off to, uh, as being liaison officers, to other, other space commands around the world, uh, US exercise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera like that? Um, you know, short, short uh, question is, you know, are you in danger of being overwhelmed and um, of your own success, really, now that space is on everyone's uh, minds? That's good. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll go, go ahead, ahead Sure. Uh, the danger of being overwhelmed, absolutely. I don't think, uh, you know, our space cadre within the Canadian context is, is, is going to be similar across everyone on the stage, and we have not stood up a space force, uh, on, you know, replete with guardians and, and new uniforms and whatnot. Um, so what we do is we've, we use, you know, existing personnel within the Canadian Armed Forces, um, Army, Air Force, Navy, SOF. We are a joint organization. Uh, we will make them space experts. They will go back to their mothership of whatever that might be, but then we hope that when they get promoted and come back and, and continue to feed into the organization. Um, but to a certain extent, we will be, and I can see this happen, a victim of our own success. We are a relatively small organization, and as we get out and explain to the Army and the Air Force and the Navy what space can do for them, what can space do against them, how they can you know, feed into all of that, um, the demand signal is increasing. You know, Every exercise, every ship that goes out the port, uh, every aircraft that deploys somewhere now comes to the Spock and says, hey, listen, you know, what can you give us as we head out? We'll take a little bit of A, B, C, and D off the menu, if you will, um, and uh, you know, that's not a bad problem to have that you're the most popular kid in high school, but uh, you know, it's certainly um, it, it's going to be a challenge for us because I don't think um, we'll be able to certainly grow the cadre much bigger than what we've currently got allocated and uh, you know, due to resource constraints. But you, Chris? I'll, I'll add the fourth. I mean, the force development side is in tension with the operational side constantly, and the expertise needs to flow back and forth. And so I think that's a key challenge, and also the, the vagaries of posting cycles. So two or three years, and then you're moved on to another posting, a duty station. The expertise takes you two to three years to become functional, and then you end up in this position where you were, you were moved off by your branch of service. So the professionalization of the space cadre, I think, is really key, and, and specifically the civilianization of some of the force development expertise. Mm -hmm. So you have a 20, 25, 30-year career that resides in space force development. Uh, I lean heavily on civilian experts in my, in my uh, department. So it's, it's really useful to hear that um, everyone's got the same sort of problem set, to be honest. But again, we're a joint organisation and the predominance of that is filled by our public servants and similarly contractors. So we're quite um, open to making sure that we're sourcing expertise that can ideally be there for longer term as we do leverage across the full joint force from where we sit. Um, there is certainly a demand signal, though, to join the team. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, this comes through to the awakening, so to speak, but we are certainly employer where people want to come into, jump on board and stay part of the team. So ideally that environment and the culture that you're setting now, and culture was an important part of the discussion this morning, but you know, it's an area where people want to stay. So retention will be key and we'll continue to recruit, but it's an exciting time. Mm -hmm. Great. Got us? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question, Tim. Um, you know, what I've found over the last year is I don't necessarily need space experts everywhere. Um, what I need is good people. Um, so in the capability world, we need people who can do capability stuff really well in an agile manner, have got an open mind, those sorts of things. You know, if, probably if you look at all of us on the stage, you know, uh, were we space experts more than two years ago? No. Um, and so there are certain areas where we absolutely need the space expertise. All the stuff that I talked about this morning with uh, the Space Operations Center and uh, an RF filing Dells. we absolutely need the right people um, in those jobs. And you're right to then move them overseas because they don't want to have to train people. 
um, <clears throat> is something that we wrestle with. We were fortunate in that uh, we have inherited certain exchange and liaison officers, and we're just making sure that we then put the, uh, the right people into, into commands. If you take uh, Brigadier Paul Tedman, who's gone into J5 at US Spacecom, he does not have a space background. In fact, he came out of, uh, of Joint Helicopter uh, Command, but has worked in a headquarters numerous times. And I think that side um, is, uh, is all the more important in order to get this done. And ultimately, that's why we're We've spent nine months looking at a training needs analysis to understand what the shape of our um, space education and training needs to be um, to get us to the, uh, to the right shape in the future. Great. Thank you. Uh, right. Thanks. We've got about three or four minutes here until we uh, go for coffee. So I'm going to try to just pull out some of the nuggets from all of that. Nothing more spectacular than me just repeating what the smarter people on stage have already said. Uh, but an idea around taking, graduating from allied by design to integrated by design, uh, understanding and presenting up front where we see our national caveats. And um, we know through lived experience, particularly in the air domain, uh, everyone comes with national caveats. It's about understanding them and then working with them, not against them. Uh, that's, a, that's a discussion topic that's come up at the CSPO quite a few times. Uh, when we're uh, small and restricted on ter in terms of people and resource and funding mechanisms, where can we bring credible capability to the coalition, not just more of the same? I, I really liked uh, the Canadian discussion around opportunity of new areas of interest the High North being one, which we see opening up. UK has just recently uh, published its uh, latest uh, High North strategy, and that's definitely an area of interest and opportunity for a broader coalition to contribute for sure. Um, massive topic of how do we, well, what we have colloquially talked uh, in our world around turning no foreign to yes foreign. How do we start with yes foreign as the starting point and work from there? Um, I know that's not always achievable, but certainly is the right ambition to have. Um, I really like Mike's comment around um, allied by imperative, and this idea of the moral high ground of an alliance. And we see that at the geopolitical level play out at the moment with Ukraine, where Russia, frankly, has become a global pariah. You know, what's that look like in space, and what would a coalition for space look like where uh, through many discussions we've had, particularly with the US and the policy team in the Pentagon, um, centers on this idea of a broader alliance for space. And I talked about it earlier in Q&A with the minister, this idea of entanglement, where, for instance, as an example, China looks uh, into the space domain and it doesn't see China v. USA, it sees China v. an entangled global coalition of like-minded spacefaring nations. Those are two very different uh, prospects for a nation to try and be an adversary against. Um, and then just very quickly, the importance of the US being in the center of this, and we shouldn't be uh, naive enough to think that we shouldn't be uh, leveraging that. You know, there is a big brother in, in space, and we've been very overt from a UK perspective around that. Um, we don't necessarily just want to hang on to coattails. We definitely want to bring something meaningful to that relationship. The trick is working out what that is, and I've just caught uh, Deanna Rouse's eye here from Space Systems Command, and I know, Deanna, this is a discussion we've had many, many times, and I know you're working on it in your international division at SSC to, to see where are those niches that could be brought to this uh, broader uh, coalition. Interfaces and standards is a common uh, point. And then a, a couple of last ones. Uh, uh, firstly, this idea of priorities, particularly if they're around ice hockey. I love that. Mm. Um, it would appear to me that uh, there's a campaign going on at UK Space Command for longer tour lengths. <laughs> With Kaz in the room, that's a five-year tour for Goddard's, I think. <laughs> uh, but lastly, and me. I think all joking aside, and I do say, say this very seriously, collaborations work and they start because of personal relationships. And it's personal relationships that actually mean that as a 
you know, as a plant, the, it's the personal relationships that's the water that continues to keep the plant growing. Um, and the fact that the bulk of our audience here has come from halfway around the world to be part of this discussion shows that there's an ambition and a willingness uh, through that, those personal relationships to make these collaborations work. So I'm hugely, hugely grateful for you making the effort. Thank you very much for your insightful comments in today's panel. Um, and if you'd please join me in a round of applause for the team. Thank you.